So we're going to finish up today uh, chapter 4. So we're looking at section 4-9. Okay. And section 4-9 is about distributed loads. Okay. So, so far in this class, when we've had a beam... looked something like this and we've put uh, maybe individual loads on it right these point loads that we say act at one distinct point okay but a lot of times we actually end up um, like say we put a hot tub on top of this because that sounds fun so we decide to put a hot tub over a canyon right when the hot tub's full of water right preferably hot water Everyone see the steam coming off of my hot tub? Is everyone awake? It's it Friday. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the weekend too, but we got to talk about my hot tub first. So when we do this, it's not really right to just give it a point load, right? Because this is more water creates just a pressure that goes across the beam. Okay? And you're used to thinking about pressures, right? You have pressure in a tire, right? PSI, so you put 30 PSI in there. Um, interestingly, so let's think about a tire for a second. The tire on your car maybe looks something like this, right? And <clears throat> let's say that we inflate it to 30 PSI, right? Does the tire in your car not look like that, Paul? Oh. Perfect. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, Travis. So if I inflate this tire to 30 PSI and my car weighs 4,000 pounds and I have four tires, let's say it's just all equally distributed. So there's 1,000 pounds acting down on this tire. Could you tell me how big the tire patch is? Yeah, so the surface area of the part of the tire that contacts the ground. What's this guy's surface area going to be? Does it? If it's 30 PSI and 1,000 pounds, I don't know. This says that it holds 30 pounds per square inch. Right? That's what 30 PSI is, is 30 pounds per square inch of pressure. So if it's 1,000 pounds, how big is that patch? Can anyone come up with a formula to figure that out? 1,000 pounds and 30 pounds per inch squared, right? So what do we need to do? We divide a thousand by thirty pounds per inch. Inch squared, yep. What am I gonna get? Thirty three point three inches squared. So Vlad said it depended on how wide your tire is. The shape does, right? So if you have a super fat tire, right? So I drew a pretty fat tire here. So maybe my tire patch is going to be fairly narrow. But if I had like a Model T tire, right? Which is a super tall skinny thing or a bike tire, right? Then it's going to have, have to be flatter this way to get that weight. Does that make sense? Okay. So... Um, that's that good old dimensional analysis stuff that we were talking about. This, though, we said pounds per inch squared in our tire. What we often do in two-dimensional two analysis is we'll say pounds per foot. So you can actually size beams as being able to carry a given load per foot. So it might be 1,000 pounds per foot or something like that. 
And so <clears throat> what's actually happening here is there is a pressure, just like in the tire, there would be a pressure that's uniform and down. Okay. But since we're doing a two-dimensional analysis, we'd say something more like, oh, maybe it's 500 pounds per foot. And that's the magnitude of this downward uh, distributed load. We call it a distributed load because rather than uh, my hot tub, let's see, I'm going to say my hot tub is six feet wide. So six feet times 500 pounds is 3,000 pounds, right? So rather than saying this is a 3,000 pound load, just in one spot, I'm drawing it as a distributed load. Okay. And distributed loads are could be anything. Water's a good example. Can you think of something else that might be a distributed load? A person? Yeah, yeah we would we would actually consider a person usually to be a point load. Okay? A group of people would be a distributed load. Right? So when you're designing um, Yeah, a flash mob would be a distributed load, right? So when you're designing the floor system in a house, right, it consists of floor joists that look like this. Yes? yes. Everybody okay with that? Oops, I'm kind of doing these wrong. And then you put plywood on top of it, psh, 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 like this, okay? And when you're making, when you're, how you are sizing these floor joists has to do with the weight that is on them. It's called the live load. And then you also have dead load. Okay, yeah. So live load, I believe in our area, live load is considered to be 25 PSF. Okay, pounds per square foot. And dead load, I think, is like 10 PSF. And these are just general guidelines, right? So dead load is things like the weight of the flooring material and... Um, the sheeting, like stuff that's part of the structure that's going to be on those. And live load is what you're actually going to put on it. So like this could be 25 PSF might be for a living room. Would it be different in a warehouse, you think? Probably. Yeah. Well, but you can, there's lots of wood warehouses, so you'd have to figure out what's, what the load needs to be, right? You're going to drive forklifts on it, or is it a warehouse for um, pillows, right? If it's a warehouse for pillows, well, maybe 25 PSF is fine. If it's a warehouse for, uh, well, I store all my gold bullion in a warehouse, and it needs to be a little bit heavier duty, right? Yeah. Gold weighs a lot. It's boring, but it's my life. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a pound per square foot. What we actually do then, let's say that these floor joists all sit on top of a giant beam on this end, right? What we can do is we can take the area of the floor, right? Maybe it's 500 square feet. And we can say, well, we have 500 feet squared. And we are designing for a, dead lo or a total combined loan of 35 pounds per square foot. Pounds per foot squared, okay? So it looks like I'm gonna have 500 times 35, oh geez, 500 times 30 is 1,500, times another five would be 2,500, 1,750? 17,500 pounds, right? That's how much it, we need to design the beam to carry, right? We're doing a gross simplification here to make you feel like this is applied, okay? I don't want you to go home and design a warehouse, please. But my teacher said I could. No, no, I did not, okay? So 17 and a half thousand pounds, let's say this is 10 feet long, and we'll say that that load's distributed across it. So we could say that this beam, if I drew the beam in just, two dimensions, we would say that the beam has a uniform load going across it with a magnitude of 1,750 pounds per foot.
Okay. Now, when we're doing uh, our analysis, though, we need to be able to deal with these distributed loads. And it gets kind of difficult. Um, well, I guess it's pretty easy if let's just do, uh, let's say instead of being supported on both ends, it's a deck that's cantilevered off of a house, right? That's kind of crazy. So what would you say that the reaction force going up has to be here? So 1750 pounds per foot, but it's 10 feet long. So a reaction force needs to be just a force, right? Oh, okay. So let's use a big number, 1750. Yeah, so it'd be the magnitude of this guy, 1750 times its length, 10 feet, for 17,500, right? Okay. What about the moment that we would need to counteract? How could we figure out what the moment would be? Okay, Josh says let's simplify it into maybe just one force or one area, right? So Josh is saying, well, maybe we should simplify it into one force. Where should we put the one force, though? Smack dab in the middle. And Josh is right, okay? We will simplify this into one force that has a magnitude of 17,500 that's right in the middle, okay? This works for, yeah, Michael. Uh, why the middle? Wouldn't you want to measure it at the end? That's a really good. That's the worst spot it could be. Okay. But is that, is it all at the end? No. No, some of it's at the middle. So really what we'd want to do, I'm going to break out some calculus here. Look out. Get ready. I scare myself when I do this, okay? <laughs> what we would really want to do is, Josh got the right answer, but let's talk about how he got there or how he should get there, rather than just being like, I think it's this. I don't know how he got there. Maybe he did calculus in his head really fast. But if I have a distributed load here, and I want to sum the moments, right? What is a moment? How do we compute what a moment is? It's a force times a distance, right? Everybody good with that? What do we do in calculus, typically? So we do integrals and derivatives, but what are we, like, theoretically, what are we doing? We're looking at these dx, dfs, what are those, right? Slopes. Thin slices, right? Michael's got it. We're looking at thin slices. So let's say that we slice this distributed load into a ton of little pieces, right? And then I'm going to look at what the moment of this guy is, and I'm going to add that to the moment of this guy, and the moment of this guy, and the moment of that guy, right? Everybody good with that? Okay. Let's say that this is a function wx, right? So it's just a function as I go along in x. Right now it's a pretty boring function, right? It's just a horizontal line. So, yeah, we like boring, but... It's just nothing changes. Would you, could you see that maybe um, rather than working on a deck, or maybe we're still working on the deck, but now we're worried about the fact that we live in Minnesota, Minnesota, right? And that the snow there drifts in the winter. And so now I have a snow drift sitting on the top of my deck. That's no longer a straight line, right? It's some parabolic thing. And so maybe, because I'm a real dork, I go outside and I very carefully excavate away the, soil, the snow, and then I take a picture of it, and then I take it into AutoCAD, and I do a best fit line onto that, and I turn that into a function. Really? Who does that? Nobody does that. Yeah, I am a blast at parties, exactly. Wait a second, the popcorn dish is all kind of like conical. Let me do a do an integral of that. Oh, I can tell you the gradient, the best way to get the popcorn out. Ah! Okay. 
<coughs> Whew, sorry. Anyways, do you agree you could do this? Yeah. 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 <laughs> do you agree you would never do this? Yeah. Good. I, I, I'm glad you would never do that. But for grins and giggles, we're going to talk about it that one time at band camp where you decide to do this, okay? So the moment then of this little guy, we're going to call this little guy DF, right? Oh, yep, with a slice of the force, DF. And he happens some distance X away from where I'm interested in summing the moment about. So we'll say A, right? So would you agree with me that maybe what we want to so the moment then is going to be x df, right, for that little piece. So then if I want all of the moments, I could take the integral over the length, okay? And then would, you, could, would it be all right with you if I said that the magnitude of that little piece of force is actually just wx, right? Everybody good with that? Okay. So what we would be doing here is that we would, and we'd have to throw in a dx if we're going over the whole length. So we're going to have uh, the whole moment is, let me draw it again, the whole moment is going to be equal to the integral over the length of x, wx, dx. Okay. So that tells me what the whole moment is. Does that work in what, what we just kind of divined, right? We said that the moment was going to be this, for the rectangle, would be 17,500 times 5 feet. Okay, so let's try that. What would our function wx be for this? 17,500. Yeah, so we're going to take the integral from 0 to 10 of x times 17,500 dx, I believe, right? Am I doing calculus right so far? Okay, interrupt me when I'm not because I don't know. So then if we do this, I'm pretty sure this becomes 1750x squared, thank you, over 2, right? Evaluated from 0 to 10. Is that right? Okay. So the, that's... 100, 10 times 100, or 10 squared is 100. So that's uh, 175,000, zero, 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 right? 175,000 divided by 2, which is mm, 87,500, which is that 17,500 times 5? Pretty sure it is. Okay, and that's going to be uh, foot pounds. All right. Now, Michael's question is, how do you know that it's in the center? Which is a really good question. Okay, so all I did is I just showed you, okay, this is how we came up with the moment using calculus, right? If we had to do that. Now let's figure out how do we know that it's five feet to the center of this guy? And the way we know that is that it goes through the centroid of the area. We'll talk more about centroids later in the uh, term. For now, though, essentially what I want to figure out is what, what's the average x, right? So <clears throat> let's call this big F, right? Maybe I'll say big F R. It's my resultant force. And I'm going to call this X bar the distance to my big F R, right? So would you agree with me that I could say X bar times big F R must be equal to, so this is the moment, right? If I take whatever my X bar is and I multiply it by the resultant force, it better be equal to the moment that I found up here, which is the integral of L, X, W, X, DX, right? Everybody okay with that? That if I'm going to replace my distributed load with a single force, 
it has to have the same moment, right? That's what we're trying to do here. We're doing for simplification. We have a distributed load. We want to replace it with a single point load, but we have to make sure that the moment experienced by, experienced by A stays the same. And so what I'm saying is that my X bar FR, so the location of my resultant force times its moment R, must be equal to what I calculate as the moment of the whole distributed load. So then, to find X bar, I can simply say, well, X bar is going to be equal to this integral, X WX DX, divided by the resultant force. Right? But what is the resultant force? It's Yeah, it's just this integral, length wx dx. What is this? If I'm finding the integral of this guy, what am I, what's another physical way to describe that? The area. the area, right? It's the area underneath the curve. Interestingly, look at this. It's 10 feet by 1,750 pound feet. If I find that area, it's... 17,500 pounds. You see that? The area underneath this guy is your resultant force. Okay? X bar then, is, which is the location of that resultant force, is just the moment divided by the total force. Oh, because moment equals force times distance. Because moment equals force times distance. Okay? All right, so. Let's try a problem. Okay, I'm giving you a beam here with a sloping distributed load. Uh, in your book and in tests and things, when you have a sloped load like this and a number next to it, that's telling you what it tops out at, right? So this goes from zero to 15 Newton meters, okay? So, could we write a function for this? Newtons per meter, excuse me. We could write a function for this, right? We need to figure out the slope. Because we go from 0 to 15 in 5 meters, so that means we're increasing how much per meter? 3 newtons, right? So the slope would be the rise, 15 newton meters over the run, 5 would give me three newton meters per meter or something like that, okay? So my WX is gonna be three newton meters X, right? Because it's zero, I'll have zero. At five, X times three would give me 15 newton meters. Everybody agree that this function works for my WX? Okay. So we're going to say A is where we're interested in. So let's find uh, what the magnitude of the resultant force that replaces this would be. So my force resultant is going to be equal to the integral of WX DX. And that's from 0 to 5 in this case because it's over the whole beam. So my resultant magnitude is going to be the integral from 0 to 5 of 3 newton meters x dx, which 
I'm going to freak myself out again here. I think we get 3 halves x squared evaluated 0 to 5. Right? You have to check my calculus. Always be suspect of Andy's calculus. Okay. So I'm pretty sure... 5 squared is 25 times 3 is 75 divided by 2 would be 37 and a half newtons. Anybody else get that? Okay. So I know I'm going to have some resultant force. Where do you think, just intuitively, where do you think the resultant force should be placed? Some place, I hear three quarters and two thirds. It would be like maybe average area. Yeah, yeah it'd be the average area. So it's going to go through the, what we call the centroid of the area. But we just know it's going to be 37 and a half at this point. And to find its location, we have to use that x bar, right? Which was uh, the integral from 0 to 5 of 3x times x dx divided by the integral from 0 to 5 of 3x dx which we know this one we just did it it's 37 and a half this integral 3x squared I believe becomes <laughs> just x cubed right mm -hmm. from 0 to 5 doesn't it 3x squared, raise the exponent, 3x cubed, take the exponent, put it down in front, be 3 over 3, which is 1. Okay, so x cubed, 5 cubed is 125, divided by 37 and a half. What is it? 3.33 meters. Okay. So we know this is 3.33 meters. Does that happen to be two-thirds? Sure does. Okay. Yeah. Why do you do the two integrals? Yeah. Um, sure. Let me, I'm going to just draw again. So the question is, why the two integrals to find x bar? And this is probably a better example. We'll just keep our little distributed load here. So we're going to replace this distributed load, right, with a single point load that we're going to call f sub r, right? And in order for it to be equivalent about point A, it has to cause the same force and moment on A, right? <clears throat> so that means uh, you're, you're good with finding the resultant force being the integral? Okay. So then the location of this guy is our x bar, right? So what we're saying here is that our resultant force times x bar has to be equal to what we said our moment was, which is this integral over the length of <clears throat> this guy, the, this function, right, wx, which we, in, uh, yeah, in this case we're saying is 3x, right? So it has to be equal to 3x. That gives us the magnitude at each point along it, and then we need to multiply it by its individual x distance, right? So if I take this little slice here, it's going to have x. And if I take this little slice down here, it'll have a different x, right? So then I need to multiply it by x. So this is the force, right? This is the distance of that force. And then I need to take that over the length, right? So good with where, where I'm getting this, all right? So then if I say, well, I, all I'm interested in is x bar, then I can divide by the resultant force. So now I have this 0 to 5 3x squared dx over my resultant force. But what was my resultant force? 
it's the area of this guy which we said well that's equal to the integral of 3x dx which I'm sure there is a better mathematical way to say this, but in engineering terms, that's why. Okay. All right. So why don't I give you one to try? That's right. You're going to love it. And I'll tell you that this is equal to, oh gosh, I probably can't even do this right. I want it to be a cubic. Um, so let's see, what would that have to be in order to be a cubic? It's going to have to be like one-third x cubed. Um, and I'll say pounds per foot. Right? And let's say this is nine feet long. Okay? So I'd like you to find the equivalent or the resultant force in where it's located. Just glance down at my page, and wouldn't you know it, that was one of the problems I'd already put in there. I can't even make up, I'm not very creative. <laughs> but go ahead and do this one. I got 546.75 pounds. Sweet. All right, so then my moment, let's say I'm looking for it about A here. My X bar location is going to be integral 0 to 9, 1 third X to the fourth DX over 546.75 pounds. So that's, uh, oh gosh, 5 1 15th x to the 5th, 0 to 9, man, the bouncy page is really. The, the X bar? Yeah, X bar. Yep, no problem. So FR, what's the difference between FR and X bar? FR is the magnitude of the resultant force, okay? And X bar is the location of it okay. from the point you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, so 7.2 feet, that's, you know, almost over here for our resultant, right? Which is where we would think it should be. Okay. Now, I have a little surprise for you. Okay. This If I lived in Minnesota, if any real engineer lived in Minnesota and they had snow that drifted on their deck and they were worried about it, 
and they said that the drift looked like this. Okay. Guess what we would do? Blow it off. <laughs> yeah, we might blow it off. Or we'd take a measuring stick, a yard stick maybe, and we'd say, oh, look, it's three feet right here. And we'd look over here and we'd say, oh, look, it's zero right there. And we'd go, oh, look at that, it's a triangle. <laughs> right? Because this is going to overpredict the load. Okay? And we can manage this without calculus because, funny thing, we know it's the area underneath this. And since, you know, seventh grade, we've been really good at finding the area of triangles, right? Of right triangles? Everybody good with that? Right? It's going to be base times height divided by two. Everybody good? All right. And since about five minutes ago, we know that this is one third, two thirds. Okay, two thirds from the skinny end, one third from the fat end. Always. Okay? So engineers see the world in first order functions, right? <laughs> it's a very straight line world, okay? <laughs> um, now, here's another one. If for some reason we saw a beam that looked like this, excuse me, uh, where we had maybe a trapezoid load, right? So we would see this as, oh, look, there's a square with a triangle on top of it, okay? And we would make this two resultant forces, one in the middle, what would the magnitude of the one in the middle be? The area of the square. The area of the square. And where would the triangle one be? Two thirds. And it would have a magnitude of the area of the triangle. Okay? If you want to geek out and do, do it this way, great. You're going to do it wrong after you've been out of school for about five years because you're not going to remember how to do that anymore. Okay? I mean, maybe you'll use your calculator and do it, but you're probably more likely going to say, I remember how to find the area of a triangle, and I remember that it's one-third, two-thirds. Just saying. Okay? All right. So let's, do, let's have you do 4142 here. Replace the distributed loading by an equivalent resultant force and specify its location on the beam measured from the pin at A. Before you dive in, how many areas are we going to break this into? Some people say two, some people say three. I'm going to say two, right? You've got one constant two kilonewton per meter distributed load, and then you have one triangle load in the corner there, okay? Now, is the magnitude of the triangle load when you do it, is it four kilonewtons per meter? No, right? What would it be? Two, because there's two here and two there, because this is two, so it's just going to be two. All right? So I'll give you a few minutes to work that out. So there's a question about where do we put this force from the end of the triangle. The way I would do this, it says replace the distributed loading by an equivalent resultant force. That's just one. So the way I would solve this is I would first say there's one F sub R. Here's another F sub R. And then you're used to doing point load ones, right? You can replace these two with an equivalent from A. Nope. Okay, let's do it together. <laughs> so, so the one that goes in the middle, right, is going to have a magnitude of 2 kilonewtons per meter times 6 meters, right? So 12 kilonewtons. Everybody good with that? And the one that goes over here is going to be the area underneath the triangle, which is going to be 2 times 3, 6, divided by 2, which is 3 kilonewtons. Agreed? The location of this one is smack dab in the middle. The location of this one is 2 meters to the right, right? Because it's 2 thirds from the skinny end, 1 third from the fat end. Right? Okay, so now if I need to find the moment about A, because I want, 
I'm going to ask for one equivalent, which is going to be right someplace in here. What's its magnitude going to be? 15, right? Because it has to account for both these to be the same. So it's going to be 15 kilonewtons. And it has to cause the same moment, right? So we have to have that 12 kilonewtons times 3 plus 3 kilonewtons times 5 is equal to 15 kilonewtons times x, right? So this would be 36 plus 15 is equal to 15x. 36 and 15, is that 51? Divided by 15 equals x. What is it? 3.4 meters. 3.4 meters. Everybody follow that? Okay, we're gonna do a couple more problems. You're, this is, like we're gonna do this every day now, okay? So let's do this one right here. Kind of fun, have diesel engines, that's kind of fun. Okay. Oops. Let me make sure I'm recording. Okay. So the distribution of soil loading on the bottom of a building slab is shown. Replace this loading by an equivalent resultant force and specify its location measured from point O. Okay. Are we going to do any calculus this time? No. 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 We're not doing any calculus this time. You break it into two triangles. Place the loads, right? They use nice numbers that are divisible by three. Two triangles. Two triangles that are really, really tiny. Those stink. Look at that. Two triangles and two rectangles. Shoot. I almost led you astray. I didn't even see that. <laughs> See, I'm so used to engineer squinting, I would have said that it goes to zero. So can you then? No. No. Okay. So it looks to me like two triangles and two rectangles. Does anyone see why I was saying I messed up? Because it doesn't go to zero, it goes to 100 pound feet right there. And 50 pound feet right here. Okay. So I'll give you some time because that's going to take some time. Really? It's terrible. Try again. There we go. All right. So, got a beam. Notice also that it's actually a floor slab, right? But I call it a beam. Because anything that's flat and horizontal in engineering is a beam. Okay? It's just how we see the world. That table, you all are sitting at beams that hold up your books. You call them tables, we call them beams. Okay? Everything is a beam. So, <clears throat> this beam has a load like this, right? And this is 300 pound feet. This is 100 pound feet. And this is 50 pound feet. 
there's 12 feet on this side and 9 feet on this side. So, did you guys break it up into one continuous 50 pound load or did you do it in halvesies? How many people did it one continuous? How many did it in halvesies? Wow, cool. All right. Nate, I feel for you. So I'll do one continuous with you. Right? Then we have another little triangle or rectangular piece here. So these are our three areas. One, two, three, and four. Right? Hmm? Okay. So let's deal with area one first. So area one has a magnitude of 50 pound feet and a length that looks like of 21 feet for a total of uh, 1,050? 1,050 pounds. And we know that's located right in the middle, right? So I'm going to say 1,050. Area 2 has a magnitude of 50 pound-feet. Tempting to say it's 100, but it's not because we've already counted for half of it. Times 9 feet. So that's going to be 450 pounds. And it's going to live in the middle of this, which is 4.5 feet from the end. Area 3... Looks like it goes from 100 to 300, so that's a change of 200 pound-feet over a length of 9 feet, but we've got to divide it by 2 because it's a triangle. So that looks like 900 pounds to me. And it's located 1 third, 2 thirds, so that's uh, 6 feet. And then area four, I go from three from fifty to three hundred, so that's going to be two fifty pound feet times twelve feet divided by two because it's a triangle. So that's um, fifteen hundred. Is that right? So I know my total resultant has a mag has to have a magnitude of fifteen hundred. 3,300 pounds. Is that what you all got? Okay. Where does it need to be located? Let's guess. Where do you guys think it's going to be? Oh, I should put this guy in here, the 900 pounds. Uh, 21, 10, 12, 8. It's right here. I'm going to guess it's going to be, I think the resultant is going to be right in here. Right? You guys all right with that guess? Okay. So to find it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from here and I'm going to sum the moments. And I'll say that first I have 900 times uh, 8. Yep, 8 feet. Right? Because it's 1 third, 2 third for the skinny to the fat. So 2 thirds would be 8. So 900 times 8 feet plus 1,050 times 10.5 feet, because it's smack dab in the middle of 21 feet, plus uh, 900 times uh, 21 feet minus 6 is 15 feet, plus 450 times uh, ooh, 21 minus 4.5 would be 16.5, is that right? Well, because I know this one, the 900 is one third, two thirds of 12 feet. So it's two thirds gives me eight feet right here. And then this one I know is smack dab in the middle of 21. So it's 21 over two, which is 10.5. And then this one over here I have marked as being six feet from this end. So I'm taking 21 minus six, because I know the whole length. This one or this one? Right here. Isn't 
up for the third triangle? Shoot. It should be 1,500. Okay. Thank you. I looked in the wrong spot. It should be 1,500, and I found 1,500 right here and then didn't put it up there. Thank you. Okay. Sierra, do you see where I'm getting the links? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so I just put them where I know. So I know that this, uh, for area three, the 900, is six feet from the end, but then I know the whole thing is 21, and I'm, I need the measurement from this point. And so I take 21 minus six gives me 15. Yep. And then for this one, same thing, four and a half feet from the opposite end, so 21 minus four and a half gives me 16 and a half. Okay. Did anyone do this calculation and come up with a number? 46,650. Uh, foot pounds. Anyone else get that? Anyone else get? Oh man, we're getting more answers the more people we ask. You got forty-three fifty? Four three nine fifty. So four three nine fifty has the majority. Unfortunately, engineering is not a democracy. I wonder what type of ocracy it is. I did it before mine and yours. 43,950. Okay. So if I have 43,950, then I need to figure out, okay, 43,950, that's the moment I need, must be equal to my resu resultant force, 3,900, okay. times its distance from that end, times x. So then I divide 43,950 by 3,900. Yeah. And x sounds like it's 11.27 feet. And that's this distance right there. Do you want us to like mark that on the drawing or do it just like from the point? We're doing like a box each I think doing both is good. Yep, both box it and mark it on the drawing. Make sense? Is that the end system or the actual, or the I, I, we can look in the back of the book and see if that's the answer. That's the, the one I came up with from doing it. Should be. It's chapter 4, number 146. It's 3.9 kip and 11.3 feet. So, yep. That is the answer. You getting something different, Blum? So must be something funky here. Okay. Let's do one more. Yeah, Sean. Uh huh. Well, it's certainly close, but I'd probably do it, like, when you say you did it a completely different way, what different way did you do it? Okay. Um, how about, we'll go out with an easy one. Do 4144 there. Replace the distributed load. Whoa, look at that. That's cool. Oh, this is going to be trippy. Oh, this is for the people watching it at home. Okay.
So first area looks like I have 200 newton meters times 5 meter for 1,000 newtons. And that's going to be at 2.5 meters. Second area looks like I'll have 600 newton meters times 2 meters, which would give me 1,200 newtons and that would be at one meter from the left hand side. And the third area looks like I'll have 600 Newton meters times three meters, but divide by two because it's a triangle. So that's going to give me 900 Newtons. And that would occur at three meters from the left hand side, right? One third, two thirds, it's three. Right? So now I just need to figure out uh, the total of it. We know is going to be 1,200, 2,200 plus 900 would be 3,100 newtons. We need to figure where that's at. And to do that, I'll say 1,000 times 2.5 plus 1,200 times 1 plus 900 times 3 must equal 3100 times x. So that's 2500, uh, 3700. Andy, yeah. For your number one. Yeah. That's still, it would be halfway in the box, right? Yeah, but no, uh huh, it'd be 2.5. Isn't two and three five? Mm -hmm. So five divided by two is two and a half. Right? I'm going all the way across with my bottom box. Oh, okay. So 2,500 yeah. and 1,200 is 3,700. Oh gosh, and 2700 would be 50, 6400 mm -hmm. divided by, so 6400 Newton meters divided by 3100 Newtons. It's going to give me 2.1, 2.0 something? 2.07 meters. Okay, so that's says it's just past here for my result. Okay? All right. That's the end of chapter four. This is will be on the midterm. This should be easy money for you on the midterm, right? These are not super intense. Like, do some of these over the weekend so that you're ready to score some points, some easy points on the midterm, all right? Um, midterm will be on Wednesday, no notes, will be the full class period. On Monday we will start chapter 5, so read chapter 5 um, and we will go from there.